The Law Commission has set the 13th as the last day to receive the public's feedback on the government's proposal for a uniform civil code. But there continues to be much confusion and much debate around what such a court might look like. I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo Story. A continued focus and analysis of what a proposed uniform civil code might look like continues on the Mojo Story. Several Muslim groups have written to the Prime Minister urging him to abandon this idea. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Sushil Modi. Sushil Modi, of course, is the leader of uh, the BJP from Bihar and he's also the chairman of the parliamentary panel on law. He is saying that in his personal opinion, all of the Northeast would have to be exempt from such a court. So even as the Prime Minister bats for such a court and talks about one nation, one law, we are already having conversations about exemptions. Parties like the Congress party say this is not the right time for a uniform civil court and have demanded to see a draft first. Parties like the Aam Aadmi party have already broken ranks with the opposition and decided to support such a court. On the program today, let's welcome our newsmaker on the program, Yogendra Yadav. Mr. Yadav, of course, is a political activist. He's a leader of Swaraj India. And he has a very, very interesting column out in the print, which basically argues that it would be poor politics by the opposition to be seen as resisting the uniform civil code per se. This is the column. The opposition is wrong in resisting the UCC. It's poor politics and it runs against the Constitution's spirit. Now, it is a it is a very important um, argument, Yogendra Ji, that you're making. Thank you for joining us. Because, of course, people would assume uh, that Yogendra Yadav is against the Modi government. He's a critic of the Modi government. So by definition, he would be against the Uniform Civil Court. In fact, there are other people I know who are critics of the Modi government, T.M. Krishna, uh, the Carnatic musician, Nilanjana Roy, the author, who in the past have drafted what they have called a progressive uniform civil code. They have put forth in the public domain a uniform civil code as they imagine it. I want to uh, understand from you first why you think it's poor politics for the opposition to oppose the UCC per se. Uh, thanks, Bakha, for this uh, conversation, which I really wanted to have, because uh, I think uh, the trouble is, as you rightly say, if Mr. Modi says something, some people are expected to oppose it, no matter what he says, uh, which indeed is very poor politics. Um, I think when we think of the UCC, let's think of three things, principles, policy, and politics. And to my mind, opposing UCC per se is bad on principles, it's misreading of the policy, and it's very poor politics. What is the principle? The principle is that principle is equality before law. That is to say, no one can say, well, we happen to treat women like this, that's how we will do it. No, uh, there are some laws. So equality before law translates into, must translate into laws that are religion neutral and gender just. This is the principle. And this is indeed the principle that's incorporated in our constitution. Directive principle of uh, state policy, Article 44, clearly says that. And to my mind, those of us who keep demanding all the time, implement this directive principle, implement that one, we cannot suddenly say, no, no, but don't implement this one. I think it's a very fair principle laid down. So on principle, there is a perfect case for the UCC. On policy, have we implemented this uh, a constitutional directive of Article 44? The simple fact is that it has been in some ways substantially achieved, but the journey is incomplete. It has been achieved by the changes in the Hindu personal law in the early 50s. But after that, again, you've had a number of other laws. There's a prevention of dowry act. There's a prevention of child marriage act. There is a domestic abuse act. All these acts, mind you, are implemented across religions. You cannot say, you know, we'll do child marriage because it's according to my religion. It says, no, this is so. So we have made advances on this constitutional promise. Is the thing complete? No, the journey is not complete. In all religions, there still are residue of laws that go against women, that go against transgender, of course. Uh, all these need to be amended. So there is still a case for UCC to be fully implemented. And third is the question of politics. 
Uh, and in politics, the simple thing is that the BJP is doing this in bad faith. Everyone knows it. BJP has nothing, no intrinsic interest in the UCC. They've never had it. Uh, they use it only as a stick to beat the Muslims or minorities in general. Now, in order to oppose that, in order to expose BJP's bad faith, you do not need to go against the principles. And sadly, some part of secular politics uh, feels so beleaguered that whenever the BJP takes stand for something, we tend to oppose it. BJP says we are for nationalism. And then from next day, we start feeling apologetic about our nationalism. BJP says we stand for Indian tradition. I mean, they know nothing about Indian tradition, but suddenly we start feeling very uneasy and guilty about uh, Indian traditions and we start criticizing that. BJP says triple talaq is bad. Triple talaq had already been annulled by the Supreme Court. Why do we need to take positions on these things? So similarly on the UCC, if Mr. Modi happens to say, all right, let's hold him on to his uh, own promise. So in a nutshell, I would say the opposition should say, and I think there has been some nuancing of the uh, position by the opposition in the last two weeks since I wrote this article. The opposition should say, all right, Mr. Modi, thank you very much. We want UCC. Let's see how you implement it. Please bring a draft. Let us see how you implement it in the Northeast. Let us see what provisions you have for the Adivasis. Let us see what you have pro provisions you have for the matrilineal societies in Meghalaya and in Kerala. Let's see what you do with the Hindu undivided family provision. Uh, let's see all that. And then if it is truly uniform, progressive and gender just, we shall accept it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you're right that the opposition, I mean, I don't think there's an opposition response, but the opposition appears to have gone from blanket opposition to saying we'll comment after the draft is put in the public domain. But mostly you have the major opposition party, the Congress still saying this is not the right time. Now, I want you to talk a little bit about this because your column in the print argues that actually it's poor politics for several reasons and one of the reasons you cite is that it clubs the opposition or it attempts to club the opposition such a resistance with the conservative religious clergy as it were uh, the orthodoxy and that can only be counterproductive so talk a little bit about that um this is a clear political ploy by the bjp and why do I say it's a ploy and not a principled position? For the simple reasons, number one, that BJP had, uh, that BJP's previous avatar, Jansang and so on, they had opposed the reforms of Hindu laws. So they were clearly not for the UCC at that point. Golwalkar, RSS's ideological chief, the RSS chief, had actually explicitly opposed the UCC in an interview in 1972, given to Mr. Malkani, no less. If you look at the present of the BJP, a party that uh, talks about uh, that, that creates religious differentiation in the CAA on the very citizenship for that party to speak about uni uniform law is rather rich, isn't it? Uh, for BJP, which has uh, had, they appointed a law commission in 2016, the law commission started a debate. In 2018, the law commission reached a conclusion after a very good report that it's not needed. So the BJP to come up is again rather strange. And if but you can, look I, at, can, can I interrupt you? The law commission says it's not needed at this time. I, I, I just want to clarify that there was a timing reference in the last law commission report. Uh, that's right. So the, that's actually a very good report in 2018. We should all read that report because the report, uh, which is called a discussion paper, goes into depth of the issues about all the laws that need to be reformed and comes up with a two or threefold strategy, which is very sensible. So for BJP, for the same government now to have another law commission to go into exactly the same question and then ask public for responses to it, while in the past they've already had some 75,000 responses. So, it, I mean, this whole thing is in bad faith. There is absolutely no doubt about it. And also, as you pointed out, now Mr. Sushil Modi is saying, maybe not the Northeast. We are getting signals from Mr. Amit Shah's office that the whole of Northeast may be exempted. Then someone will say, well, the Adivasis must be exempted. So who should not be exempted? I mean, SGPC has already protested. So at some stage, six will also be exempted. So what is it? 
This is simply a stick to beat the Muslims. That is what the BJP is all about. However, what should the opposition do? The opposition must stand its ground, its principled ground. And the principled ground can only be that, yes, we support UCC. Please remember, the Uniform Civil Code is not a product of BJP's imagination. It is a constitutional principle, a principle that was vigorously advocated by Jawaharlal Nehru, by Dr. Ambedkar, by Congress critics like Ram Manohar Lohia. I mean, all these had advocated. Now, if the BJP says we stand for it, suddenly we should not turn around and say, therefore, we oppose it. And please remember, to my mind, the most significant interlocutor in this debate has been India's feminist movement. Feminist movement has consistently taken a position uh, against religious orthodoxy on the one hand, whether it's a Hindu orthodoxy or a Muslim orthodoxy, and against BJP's attempts to appropriate it. That, to my mind, should become the national stand. And I'm sure parties like Congress and other parties will wear towards that. And incidentally, asking for a concrete draft is a very good idea. I think that's what everyone should do. That in principle, I, I refuse to oppose the envelope. I want you to, I want to be able to open it. The envelope is yeah. lovely. UCC is a lovely name. It's a good principle. I want to open it and see what is exactly that you have to propose. And BJP's political strategy is actually never to open the envelope and to keep yeah. inviting the opposition and say, you know, and the whole point is to create a photo op. Photo op in which Congress and other opposition parties are seen to be standing with the most conservative elements of minority communities. Congress should not do it. No other party should do it. Aam Aadmi Party should not do it. No other party should do it. And, and not just the photo op issue. I think in substance too, the fact is that as and when you try and implement the Uniform Civil Code, some conservative elements from each religious community, all of who think they are takedars of their community, they will oppose it. This has always been the case. And secular politics will have to muster the courage to to to, to be to stand up to them. I, I am I am glad that you make a reference to the first movement because it is for that exact reason that I personally do support, uh, and I should say that up front, uh, a progressive family law because I do believe that the orthodoxy uh, of every faith, not any one faith, if eventually penalizes women. Eventually, that's what, for me, the heart of this conversation is and should be about. But I do want to come back to Sushil Modi. I was interviewing him just a short while before our conversation with you. And he said to me, the Constitution is clear. Article 371 says that the northeastern states have a special status. I said to him, the Article 370, which is, of course, the Kashmir special status abrogation, has just been placed before uh, the su Supreme Court. How do we make both arguments in parallel? He did not see the contradiction. He said the assemblies of the northeastern states would have to ratify any uniform civil code. Now, if we are starting with exemptions, what is the, what is the honest conversation that we can have about this quote. Ah, Barkha, you could have also read the Constitution, Article 44, back to Mr. Sushil Modi. The Article 44, on which the whole thing is premised, Article 44 is the article in the directive principles of uh, state policy that, uh, that, that mandates uniform civil code. And what does it say? The state shall endeavor to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. I mean, it's written into the Article 44 itself that they would not, that it, so what is it that the article is saying? The article is saying that you have, shall endeavor to secure. It does not say you have to have one single legislation, but it should be secured for the entire, throughout the territory of India. If they wanted to give an exemption to the Northeast, that could have easily be written, or at least this phrase could have been avoided throughout the territory of India. So the intent of the constitution makers was absolutely clear that religion neutral, gender just laws, family laws must be implemented across regions, across religions, across communities. So in that sense, Mr. Sushil Modi is already 
not reading the constitution correctly. And to my mind, that clearly exposes BJP's intent. I mean, the whole thing is driven by a simple vote politics. BJP well, Sushil come... Modi, may, may, I, may I intervene just to be fair to Sushil Modi and represent him in a little... His argument was that he's not arguing, and he said that he made it clear this is his personal position. He isn't speaking at the parliamentary panel uh, chief. He said that the Adivasis, the tribal communities, especially of the Northeast, they have age-old that actually cannot be looked through the framework of religion. He said he said that the, to identify these tribal communities by religion is very difficult in the Northeast. They come from a from a completely different context and therefore the constitution exempts them you are saying that you find that uh, you, you don't agree with that because you say the directive principle is clear. it's applicable uniformly and that's why it's called a uniform civil code I'm glad Mr. Sushil Modi recognizes that uh, Adivasi communities uh, cannot be looked at simply from the prism of religion, because that's exactly what his party has been doing, claiming that some are Christian and everyone else is Hindu. So I'm glad Mr. Sushil Modi is beginning to understand the northeast of India. Uh, this applies not only to the northeast, Parka. There are customs and practices in the Adivasi communities in the rest of the country. And not just in the Adivasi communities. I think we people are so misinformed about these things. Uh, you and I, Barkha, come from North India. Now, marrying your mama or your mama's son would be sacrilege, isn't it, for us in North India? In Kerala, this is not only in and, and, and not, not for Adivasi communities. It is for general standard, what is called mainstream of India. That is the most preferred marriage, marrying your mamaji. Now, these are customs. These are very, very different customs. So, yes, in a large and diverse country like India, you have to allow for customs and differences across things. The only thing you need to do is to ensure that there is that none of these customs violate the basic principle of gender justice as and when they do. Remember, untouchability was also presented as a custom of the Hindus. The constitution makers said nothing to it. These customs shall have to go. So one major, uh, you know, I, I think Mr. Sushil Modi is now beginning to arrive at uh, what uh, what they should realize that uniformity does not mean identical set of laws. Unfortunately, that's a misperception which drives both the supporters and the opponents of uniform civil code. Everyone believes that uniform civil code would mean that all the marriage acts of the Hindus, of Parsis, of Christians, etc., shall be replaced by one single law. That's not required. That's nowhere mandated in the Constitution. Constitution says uniform civil code. It does not say it identical. It does not say the same law should be implemented to all that. To my mind, the most reasonable, the only possible sensible reading of what the Constitution requires us to say, to do, is that there should be uniform principles which may be, which will have to be implemented through differentiated laws which allow for customs and specificities of each community. For the Hindus, marriage is a sacrament. For the Muslims, it's a contract. Now, why should the constitution come into play in this? That's all right. These are very different things. I just mentioned the rules about where, who you can marry and who you cannot marry. This varies across the Hindu communities throughout the country in some significant ways. Why not? So the only reasonable interpretation of uniform civil code is uniform principle, differentiated rules, which is how they exist. And the sensible way of implementing the uniform civil code, and this is something suggested by 2018 report of the Law Commission, it's actually a very good report, and I'm surprised not many people read it. And so far, people have just quoted one sentence from it, saying uniform civil code should not be implemented right now. But I would really want us to debate, because they go into every single law to do with marriage, divorce, adoption, and uh, inheritance and suggest the changes that need to be brought about. What is the way to bring it about? There are threefold ways that comes from that report, and I think that's the best way of implementing uniform civil code. Number one, amend the existing laws across all religions, across customs, across regions, as and when they violate the principle of gender justice. Number two, 
for many communities, the laws are still uncodified. Muslims are, in fact, one of the major examples of that. Parsi law is codified, Christian law is codified, Hindu law is codified. Muslim law is not sufficiently codified yet. You need to codify it. And the third thing would be to create one special set of laws uh, along the lines of the Special Marriage Act. You can create one common civil code and say whoever does not want to be governed by any religion specific law is welcome to take this up. Provide a third option yes. that's what Dr. Ambedkar suggested. That, to my mind, is the most sane and sensible way of implementing uniform civil code, and which is what we must always support. Let me ask you a political, somewhat semi-political question. You've spoken about the potential trap the opposition may fall into. Is one of the traps to also frame the opposition to the uniform civil code only in terms of the BJP's policy towards Muslims. I say this because a uniform civil code, as you mentioned, this tradition of, uh, you know, marrying within the family among cousins or uncles in, in, in the South. Uh, but there's also, for example, the Hindu undivided family, the HUF. It is not as if Hindus are going to be exempt from a uniform civil code. And I'm not sure that a large section of India's population understands that this could change a lot of what uh, you know, the status quo is have taken for granted. So do you think that it's also flawed politics to frame this only as a majority minority debate? Absolutely. And that's precisely why I want to see the draft. Now, the 2018 report of the Law Commission, incidentally, that's a commission appointed by Mr. Modi's government. It is not a inherited from a commission inherited from Congress government that report clearly makes two recommendations about major reform in the Hindu law. One is to do away with the law of copper scenario, which is basically to say that, uh, I mean, the principle of copper scenario, which is to say that all those who have any, who, whose family lineage can be traced to someone who has left some property, all of them would be entitled and all the legal hassle that all Hindu families go through usually is because of this one doctrine. They say this should be abolished. The second proposal made by the uniform, uh, by, by the Law Commission 2018 uh, discussion paper is to do away with Hindu undivided family tax provision. It's a clear recommendation that they make. Now, I want to see how many of those who are batting for uniform civil code are prepared for these things. Uh, while everyone talks of polygamy among Muslims, and you know, well, polygamy among Muslims should be abolished. Uh, I mean, we do know the facts. The facts are that there is not much difference between Hindus and Muslims when it comes to polygamy. But no one talks of a practice among the Hindus, which is that of just abandoning their wives. Uh, Barkha, we do know of some famous people who've done so, haven't, don't we? You know, Parityakta Mahila. This is such a widespread practice against which there are no provisions in the law. Why not address this? So why everyone is so glued on to what's wrong with Muslims? And incidentally, those who are glued on to are mostly not Muslims. So, you know, there's, there's a very strange, I mean, half comical, ridiculous kind of things that Muslims are allowed for marriages. I mean, it's as if it's a special privilege and it, it's great fun that Muslims can have great fun. We can't have it, that kind of thing. Um, now, this is a ridiculous way of approaching it. Uh, there are, I mean, if there is, and as you rightly point out, there are many provisions in the existing Hindu laws that need to change. There are provisions in the Christian law that need to change because Christians' laws are still very, uh, they make divorce extremely difficult. They are very unsympathetic to, uh, in that sense, to women. Parsi law needs to be amended. All these laws need to be amended. In, incidentally, the Special Marriage Act itself needs to be amended because it has a provision for giving notice which leads to yeah. all the complications. So all these laws need to be amended. And I guess I think the most sensible thing would be not to see this merely through the prism of uh, Muslim, um, uh, Muslim laws that need to be changed. And when we speak of the Muslim laws, I think once again, I would go by uh, organizations like the uh, you know, uh, Muslim Mahila Andolan, which have taken a very progressive, sensible, 
position on these issues, which has said that, uh, look, Muslim laws need to be changed. There are lots of things which are anti-women. They need to be changed. And let us not all the time simply say, because BJP happens to advocate it, let's not do it. You know, Let's not replay the Shabano situation again and again. That was a sad moment for our democracy. We should not replay that. And if that means that some of the Muslim conservative leadership would oppose it, so be it. If it means that some of the uh, Sikh or uh, Christian leadership would uh, oppose it, so be it. And if it means that many of the uh, so-called Santa and Swamis within Hinduism would oppose it, so be it. That's exactly the constitutional imperative. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm glad you make this point because, you know, we saw how powerful status quoist um, sort of tradition can be uh, with, with, with Sabrimala, where the Supreme Court actually intervened to say, let menstruating women pray at the shrine, and then ha is now reviewing its own verdict because the pushback, including from women, because after all, women are also socialized by the same patriarchy as men, uh, said, said, no, this is not possible. So we should be ready if this actually goes through for pushback, even from even from from some women, not all women, but some women. Uh, I want to ask you a last question. Abhishek Singhvi, um, uh, speaking again in his capacity more as a lawyer than a congressman, he said maybe a way forward is that we agree on certain fundamental principles that cannot be compromised. And we say the Uniform Civil Code will, you, you restrict these spaces or the areas to which it applies. And that is one way of assuring people that it is not a homogenous bulldozer being driven over culture, over cultural individualism, over culture, rituals, traditions. It's not making us all one, except in the principle of equality. That is the only principle that actually we're looking at. But for that, he argues, you would have to restrict the areas it applies to. Do you agree with that? The first part, which is to yes, the principles should first be clearly laid down. Principle will have to be of justice. Uh, the principles will have to be of religion neutrality. And the word uniform itself must be spelled out. I mean, nowhere in the world uniform means identical. You know, you have school uniforms. Does it mean that boys and girls wear the same thing? Does it mean, mean that tall and short boys have the same set of clothes that they wear? Uniformity is always interpreted to mean the same, a certain similarity of principles. So, yes, I agree with Abhishek Manu Singh with that those principles should be spelt out. The meaning of uniformity should be clearly said. And once that meaning is spelt out, I think that uh, delimitation part of it must happen already. Uh, but I don't quite understand, uh, you know, what it would mean to say where it would apply, where it would not apply, etc. Uh, he's a lawyer. I'm not. He understands legalities and legal principles infinitely more than I do. But in my simple political common sense. Uh, it is quite clear that uh, that uniformity of principles must apply to laws that relate to marriage, divorce, uh, adoption, and inheritance. These are the four things involved here. Uh, you cannot possibly exempt things uh, too much. Uh, to my mind, the best way would be to say, uh, to lay down these principles first and then begin a nationwide genuine consultation. This is a sensitive matter across communities. There are, you know, millions of instances of things that are uncodified right now in the country. To run a bulldozer on all of them would be absolutely stupid, insane evolve a national consensus. We already have partially implemented the constitutional mandate of uniform civil code through Domestic Violence Act, anti, uh, you know, child marriage act, etc. Take it further by amending these laws substantially. Codify some of the laws which have not been codified, but then do it with the help of the communities. Incidentally, the six have also been demanding a, a separate act for themselves. All these things have to, to be taken into account. Codification of practices need to be done. And finally, for people like you and me, who may not wish to be governed by any one religion, provide them a full common civil code to say, all right, you want, you opt for it, you can be governed by that. That is the only way forward that we must move towards.
in 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 many ways before we conclude we also have to acknowledge that we are a society in transition we're diverse we're gigantic but also values around a uh, you know marriage divorce the place of women in a relationship these are all changing and we have to change with them the same sex marriage petition in the supreme court is a very important illustration of how we have to understand these new these new ideas yogendra ji so i think we can't just hold on to what we once knew uh, change is inevitable and i think all we can do is to try and look for equality in that change recently i read something written by vidyanivas mishra which actually says the word parampara actually means exactly that parampara is not tradition parampara is not holding on to past parampara is about changing in the you know taking core principles of the past but transforming them in the light of the future so when you and i speak about gender we mostly speak about women but it's time we spoke about the transgenders we speak about the entire lgbtq spectrum things are changing and changing that and interpreting the constitutional mandate which fortunately is a very open ended mandate uh, interpreting that mandate in the light of our times is the only way forward and i do hope that uh, bjp is very you know a uh, very petty minded if i may say so uh, targeted at 2024 election that does not end up spoiling that larger constitutional process that must go on and bjp should not be allowed to vitiate this entire debate i also hope that the opposition pays heed to what you're saying because otherwise it's a self stereotyping uh... exercise which is i think the essence of uh, your column thank you yogendra ji always a pleasure thank you very much yogendra yadav thank you thank you it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work if you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to mojo story and support independent robust journalism